It's really a treat to be uh, hosting Martin Amos, who's in over more than 45 years as a professional writer, has distinguished himself in, in both fiction and, and nonfiction. Since his first novel, The Rachel Papers, in 1973, Martin has gone on to write something like 16 works of fiction and more than a half a dozen works of, of nonfiction. His sharp, nimble intellect and engaging prose have contributed to his reputation as one of the most influential and innovative voices in contemporary British fic fiction and one of the most literate and entertaining authors of nonfiction pieces. Uh, it's also a matter of record, of course, that Martin's charm, talent, linea lineages as the son of Kingsley, and good looks have attracted women, tabloid gossip columnists, and no small amount of envy over, over the years. Um, now, in a, in a new collection of his essays and, and reporting, uh, The Rub of Time, um, uh, Martin has brought together 44 pieces that uh, appeared over the past two and a half decades in various publications. Uh, they cover a range of topics, uh, literary, political, sporting, and personal. Uh, in an admiring review in the New York Times, the critic A.O. Scott called the book, quote, a vital addition to any Amos fan's bookshelf, and the perfect primer for readers discovering his fierce and tremendous journalistic talent for the first time. Other reviewers have used, used such terms as witty, erudite, full of flair and certitude to describe the writings in the collection. Martin will be in conversation with Tope Falaran, a writer based here in Washington. The Washington Post profile of Tope several years ago recalled a time when, uh, out of work, uh, he'd come to p, p almost daily and sit uh, in the coffee house, not to eat or drink, but to copy poetry into his notebooks. Uh, he was uh, too poor at the time to buy books, but determined to learn his craft. And in 2013, this Rhodes Scholar, the son of Nigerian immigrants, was awarded the prestigious Kane Prize, given annually for a short story by uh, an African writer. And with that came instant legitimacy. Tope's debut novel, The Proximity of Distance, uh, is due to be published uh, probably next year by Simon & Schuster. So please join me in welcoming Martin Amos and Tope Flaring. Martin, it's such a pleasure to meet you. I've long admired your work, and I really loved reading this collection. I learned a great deal about topics I thought I knew a great deal about. Um, and I think that actually leads to the first thing I wanted to ask you about the collection. Um, your essays cover a wide range of topics. You talk about tennis, literary figures, movie stars, etc. cetera. Um, does your interest in a particular subject precede the writing? Or do you write about something because you're interested in it? Yeah, it's that way around. Yeah. And I'd like to say, by the way, that um, thank you all very much for coming. And um, Washington is very resonant for me as a place to visit because my friend Christopher Hitchens, one of your uh, brightest sons, because he did adopt Washington. Um, I, am, I was very sad on the train coming down because it reminded me of all the times I came down when he was sick. And uh, anyway, uh, here's to the hitch, wherever he may be. Um, I, write a, uh, I write about things that already interest me. Um, and sometimes I write about things just to fortify myself for writing about them in fiction. The two examples in that book are the long piece on um, the Queen, um, which I, was, I viewed as research for a novel that does have a royal family in it, British royal family. And the piece on pornography was uh, for the same novel, um, a section on um, the Californian pornography industry. And writing about, writing about it as a journalist, it's, it's interesting in that that's all 
the front bit of your brain. But if you research something for a novel, then it, it takes a couple of years for it to sink in. And what happens with a novel? Um, in the, a neat example is Norman Mailer, who said he wanted to write a novel about September the 11th, beginning it on September the 12th. But he was very wise about the process of fiction. And he said um, it would take three or four years before it had gone into your brain, gone down your spine, into your sort of viscera, and up again, and then you're ready to do it. You recruit the subconscious, and, uh, and that takes a while. And sure enough, in 2004, 2005, three or four novels on September 11th came out. Jay McInerney, Claire Nassau, John DeLillo. I mean, I, and I thought, mm, dead right, that's how long it takes. So um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't attempt to write about a literary essay on something I didn't know pretty well. You've described novel writing as a spooky process. That's Norman Mailer's. Yes, you were sort of borrowing yeah. his, um, his uh, description of novel writing. Is there any way to prime the pump, as it were, to get at that process or to system, systematize it? Um, a little bit. Um, it, is, it, it is a spooky uh, art. There's no doubt about it. And I used to talk to my father and stepmother, both of whom were novelists, um, about this. And, and you, you, sometimes you don't even want to talk about it because it's so mysterious to you. It's why I would never have, I would never go to a psychiatrist, no, no matter how, <laughs> in what psychological distress I found myself. Because I, I feel they would sort of mess with this process. But to give an example of how you humor the subconscious, I, it, when I was younger, I used to, and I came across a difficulty in something I was writing, I would just peep at it, you know, stubbornly, bloody-mindedly, just bang my head against it. And that would, I wouldn't, it wouldn't occur to me to do that anymore. If I come across a difficulty, I walk away from my desk, and it's even more physical than that, in that it's my legs that take me away. And uh, you, for a few hours you do something else, you may need to sleep on it, maybe sleep on it twice, but then suddenly your legs take you back to the desk and you realize you, you have solved it, or subconscious has solved it. Um, it's, it, is, it, it is very weird, and I don't know uh, no, I know no critics who understand it, and I know no writers who understand it. Many of the essays and reviews in this book feature a, a postscript um, where you kind of talk about how the subject, your thinking on the subject has evolved, or how the subject itself has evolved over time. Were you generally happy with these essays when you went back to, to review them? Um, I was, yeah, I was... Um, agreeably surprised and impressed by many of them. Um, because I don't, I don't really enjoy writing ess literary essays. I think it's the hardest thing I do. You know, you've got to know stuff, you've got to have ideas, and, and above all, you've got to organize it. Um, so I'm, I'm always amazed, I'm amazed at the time when it's published in a magazine or a paper, and, uh, and I think this is, if I see it, if I've just handed it in, it looks like gibberish to me, but if, if there's been a decent interval of a week or two, I'm always uh, impressed by how sort of convincing it looks, because yeah. you've gone through such, you know, labor and, and unhappy labor to produce it, uh, and when you see it in a book, um, it looks even more <laughs> convincing. Uh, but it's, it is a bit of your mind that you don't use except for that purpose. Reportage, I'm sure, I'm sure you know, is, is easy because you're describing an event. Describing a Trump rally is um, very straightforward. Uh, you do have to organize it a bit, but... Um, 
it usually presents itself to you. Um, but getting an asset, whipping an essay into shape, um, I think I, I, every time I do it, I think, oh, you fool, you've done it again. You know, you condemned yourself to three weeks of unhappiness. And I think it's just sort of the, the work ethic, Protestant work ethic. There was no Protestantism in my house when I was growing up. Um, I mean, the, the, the concept of God just never came up in my house. And once when I was filling in a, a form for school, I veered back from the form because it said religion. What's your religion? Um, and I, I ran out into the, the hall and shouted up the stairs, Mom! She said, what? And I said, what religion are we? And then there was a really long silence. <laughs> And then she said, Church of England. And I, I felt such relief. I mean, Church of England was pretty good anyway, because nothing was expected of you. Uh, although when I, when I stayed with friends, um, I used to, if it was a sleepover on a Saturday night, I used to go to church with the family the next day. And it always gave me the creeps. Um, and I thought, what are they doing? There's grown men and women down on their lousy knees. To what? Um, but the work ethic has lingered. And the oddest people have habit. And, um, and, it, and I, all of them say they, they, they're glad they've got it. There's a touching aside in one of your essays where you're talking to your late friend, Christopher Hitchens. You try to convince him to be agnostic as opposed to an atheist. I was really, uh, why, were you, why did you include that? Is it, well, this is agnosticism v. atheism. And he always proudly said he was an atheist. And I said, you know, that reminds me of the enterprising termit, termite who claims to be an individualist um, in that... He's not seeing the, the bigger picture. Uh, what we know about the universe is pathetically partial. Um, and there are huge questions that have been at a dead end for 30, 40 years. And um, they keep finding things out that, that make them think, you know, Christ, we've got it that wrong. Um, when it was discovered that the, work, that the universe was not only uh, flying apart, but flying apart at an accelerated rate. I was in the Californian Institute of Learning and there was the famous cosmologist Kip Thorne in the cafeteria and I went up to him and said, what does this mean for you? And he said, what does it mean? It means that I've just come out of the house, I've got my car keys, I throw them up in the air, and they just keep going. Uh, we don't understand galaxy formation. The, the contents of the universe, 80% of it is either called dark matter or dark energy. And they're, they're reduced to referring it as material, dark material, because they know nothing about it. So the idea that you can say there is no higher intelligence seems to me a contradiction since the universe is a higher intelligence than we are. We're eight or nine Einsteins away from understanding some very basic things. Um, and to then say I'm an atheist seems a bit presumptuous and, and uh, premature. We just don't know enough. I'm, if you imagine uh, uh, agnosticism as a sort of uh, high wire. You should be just about to fall off into atheism, but you need a bit more evidence. Yeah. <laughs> it's a particularly resonant comment, especially in light of uh, Stephen Hawking's passing last night. So. When, when what? Sorry. Stephen Hawking's passing. Indeed. Um, yeah, last night. So I just said it's a resonant sort of comment. Indeed. Yeah. Although he, I mean, he, he's known as the, the greatest cosmologist of his generation, and he probably is, but his contributions to absolute knowledge are, are quite marginal in that 
that black holes give off radiation. That's him. And it's called Hawking radiation. But that's, it's hardly E equals MC squared. I mean, it's, um, it's not foundational, is it? Um, you write a great deal about Jewish American literature, in particular Bello and Ra. And I was surprised by your, and I, I don't know why, but your argument that Jewish American literature is actually quite new. I mean, you, that you say that it starts with Saul Bellow in 1950. Um, so it's still kind of emerging as a corpus of work. I was wondering if you had a sense of what the 21st century literature will be. Do you have a sense of, of who's writing that literature, uh, what it's about? Um, well, this is making the bold assumption that there still will be a literature, or, or robust literature. And I know many people who say um, it would be lucky to still be around them. Zadie Smith, who's 40, early 40s, said, um, said to me years ago, she said, she said, it'll last your time, but I don't think it'll last mine. This means a coherent literary culture, and um, with a certain feeling for its place in civilization and its centrality in civilization. And, um, and I can well imagine that becoming woollier. Uh, I don't think it's to do with the, the literary novel, which, which really became what it is now in quite recently, in 1980, roughly, um, by which time I was, I'd already written three novels. Um, and suddenly it all changed when I published my fourth. All the superstructure stuff was there in place. Um, when I started, there were no, no interviews, no festivals, no radio, no TV, no profiles, no photo ops. All that came around 1980. And the reason for it, I, I don't think there was a spontaneous flowering of interest in the psychological insight and uh, Curlicued sentence. It was a. It was a. It was born by the media. In the the papers had been getting fatter and fatter. The Sundays, then the Saturdays, then all all the days in between. And they and what bulked out the media, and this is true in other forms, radio, television, is that they they ran out of you know alcoholic actors and depressive comedians and ne'er-do-well royals and furious fashion models and uh, adulterous golfers and wife-beating footballers and rapist boxers. Uh, and to their horror, in England at least, they found themselves reduced to writing about writers. <laughs> um, a class that they, the journalistic class in, in England really hates. Um, uh, literary writers, because it's a it's a it's a funny accident that novelists deal in prose narrative, and so does journalism. And and I I'm unwilling to believe that the average journalist and in England journalism is really first rate, and uh, there's a lot of it. But I don't think they, when they started out, they wanted just to be journalists. They all had a sort of secret yearning to be serious writers, um, or more serious writers. So there's a, there's a sort of sneering subtext often. And also because, whereas in America, uh, I, don't, I don't sense that from journalists at all. And for historical reasons, perhaps, in that, um, you know, when America was performing uh, and, and it was wondering what it was. What is America? Was it just a collection of uh, Brits, Italians, Jews, Germans, or was it a nation with a soul and a, and a meaning? And Americans sensed subconsciously, probably, that writers would play a part in 
in helping to define what America was. And, uh, and in Britain, they don't want any of that. I mean, they, they, they know who they are. They, their literature began in the 12th century. Um, America's a young country, so they, they're more uh, forgiving and, and welcoming and tolerant in that department. Yeah, it sounds like you're, for me that sounds like an argument for the continuation of the novel, I mean, the, and perhaps even the perpetuation of literary culture, because what you're describing in many ways is writers writing the national narrative. Uh, the great American novel perhaps is one permutation of this idea. Certainly. Um, and for me, doesn't that mean that perhaps we're waiting, or, or maybe there are a few writers who can continue to do that essential work, at least in America? Well, I'd like to think so, um, but it used to be a minority interest sphere and uh, may well retreat back into being that. I mean, we, we don't know the effects of, um, and I think the, the invention of the internet, uh, and the half the planet has now got internet access. I was, it struck me at the time that this was an evolutionary moment comparable in mythic terms to Eve biting on that apple. It was a sort of little fall from Eden. Um, and remember the, the fruit she bit on was from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And uh, we all have benefited hugely from the internet but um, I'm very suspicious of it, and I think the, stupef the stupefying effects of the internet and, the, and the, the nastiness it seems to release in human beings is, is, has got a long way to go to express itself. I mean, I, uh, the, the advent of Donald Trump, I think, says something about the intelligence of the average voter in America. Um, and I've been told by many Americans rather gloatingly that I can no longer sneer at America, America's credulity because of Britain and Brexit. Um, and it's a, it's a pretty good point, but um, the difference between Brexit and Trump is that uh, Britain had no idea what Brexit would look like. It, it, was, it was a burn your boats and leap in the dark moment for Britain. But um, if we had known in England that Brexit had orange skin and yellow hair and um, couldn't complete a six-word sentence without a repetition or a tautology, I don't think we would have voted for, for, for it. But Americans had seen nothing else but Trump for a year and a half. And instead of wanting less, they wanted more. Yeah. No, on this topic, I really enjoyed reading your piece um, about Mitt Romney and Republican contenders in 2012. You actually wrote, who will perpetually submit to being lied to with a sneer? The effects of dishonesty are cumulative. Undetectable by focus groups or robocalls, they build in the unconscious mind creating just the kind of unease that will sway the undecided in November. I couldn't help but think about 2016 when, you know, somebody it, lied with a, a sneer throughout his... Um, I was right about 2012. Yeah, I was, no, exactly. I was wrong about 2016. What happened in the interim? What happened in the national character? I, that's, a, that's a pressing question. And um, in tw 2012 already, I talked to strategists and, and I said, isn't it a problem for you guys that uh, Paul Ryan's speech last night turns out to be a pack of lies because it was exposed in the New York Times item by item? And I listened to the speech live and it was quite uh, convincing in a, in a sort of sinister way. But, but I, I was very relieved to see he was lying his head off throughout. And I said, isn't that going to give you a bit of PR work to do, and they said, we don't anticipate that. And their slogan was, already in 2012, there is no downside to lying. And if, 
if you don't feel a personal downside to lying, then God help you. I mean, if you can lie as Trump does when there's a documentary about his golf course in Scotland, and there he is on television uh, saying uh, ecologists, the Greens love my plan. And this, the Greens turn out to be one guy in a basement with a mobile phone, completely unrecognized by any other group. Um, and there he is sort of really relishing telling a lie. You know, parents used to say of certain children, you know, he or she would rather tell a lie than tell the truth. Um, and one of my daughters was a bit like that for a while, when she was two. Um, but um, he, he really, he would, it makes no difference to him whether it's a lie or not. And his, his common touch, his populist touch, may be based on the fact that, that a diminishing number of people mind lying as a sort of moral failure. Um, and, and that, once the truth goes, well, what's, I, I think it's all nonsense about, you know, uh, reality outstrips satire, you know, what a novelist's going to do. There's no problem about that. Novelists will find a way. But um, if the truth no longer matters, then you know, almost everything is, is in danger. I've been nursing a pet theory for some time that there's something, and I perhaps, um, you know, I shouldn't say this in this setting, but there's something about, that tells me that, that Donald Trump is something of an artist, right? Like an artist is concerned with world building um, and marshalling facts and lies and all kinds of things to create the world they would want to live in or that they want their readers to live in. And this is essentially what Trump has done. I mean, he has said, to a group of people, um, yes, your way of life is, will no longer be um, acceptable uh, in the 21st century, um, but with me it will be. With me, I will not only, it will not only be acceptable, I will perpetuate it. Um, the kind of life and... Like the coal industry. Well, precisely, the coal yeah. or, or even this idea of, of this deeply embedded kind of white supremacy, right? Like, from a numerical perspective, um, that's passing away. Uh, That's the worst thing he's done. And yeah. it, it's only since in the last couple of months that I've really come to feel that. I think what he is saying, he's not only saying your way of life is safe with me, he's saying, um, you know, and this gets to part of the core of it, that, that what he's saying in his rallies is, um, he's saying, and it's all uh, in a whisper, it's not what he's actually saying, but what he's suggesting is that um, you know the elite media and the eggheads and the uh, and the citified know-alls say that you're stupid and you don't know anything, saying to his crowd, uh, "Well, look at me. I'm stupid. I don't know anything either, um, and I'm I." You know, the elite media will tell you that you have to uh, educate yourself throughout your life. Otherwise, you're bound to fall behind. He said, well, I don't do any of that. And look at me, I'm the multi-billionaire commander-in-chief. It's, it's a sort of um, idiots of the world uh, unite. And, and we're the really smart ones in some way he hasn't explained. And anti-elitism, which I, I must admit I don't really understand, except as a kind of reflex. I mean, who's an anti-elitist when they go to the doctor? Who's an anti-elitist when they get on an airplane? Um, uh, it's a way of suggesting that the subject under discussion isn't very important um, if you scorn expertise. And... They, they like to say that about literature. You know, he's a sort of elitist kind of writer. He, um, meaning respect, grammar, and the meaning of words. And, um, 
but um, that's a way, another way of saying that it doesn't matter because anything that matters, like your health or your survival, we're natural leaders. But politics is serious. I mean, that does affect your life and your freedom. Um, and he's, I don't give him, I don't give Trump credit for any, for having two consecutive thoughts in his head for the last 20 years. Um, and I, I think he's just sort of blundering through it. I don't think he has a strategy. And he thinks he's so marvelous that he can sort of wing it, and they love him anyway. And when he said that I could shoot someone on Fifth Avenue without losing a single vote, he actually blundered into the, into quite near the truth, in that they don't think he's a real, he's real. They think he belongs to reality TV and, and this sort of mythologized world of uh, money and planes and all of them, beauty pageants and all the rest of it. Um, but they don't, they don't see he's a reality in quite the way uh, Democrats do. I think partly because of Trump, we uh, inhabit this moment in which more people are speaking their own truth. They're talking about things that have happened to them over the course of many years, uh, things that perhaps were swept under the rug for various reasons. Um, and I know that uh, Philip Larkin is one of the people you most admire. And in response to some of your own misgivings about his beliefs, you wrote, but I bore in mind the simple truth that writers' private lives don't matter, only the work matters. Um, and this is something I've been struggling a great deal with myself because I've since discovered that many of the people I deeply admired are not the people I, I thought they were. One example that comes to mind is uh, Bill Cosby for me. He, uh, was somebody who I admired greatly when I was growing up. My parents are from Nigeria. And so, uh, when I was quite young, my father watched uh, I Spy when he was a child, when he was younger in Nigeria, and so he made us watch it. And the, the Bill Cosby character in that uh, show uh, was a Rhodes Scholar. And I think Bill Cosby won an Emmy for that. I mean, he was the first black actor to win an Emmy, and of course he went on to have this fabulous career that inspired many people, uh, so much so that his show was banned, the Cosby show was banned in South Africa in the apartheid regime because many people, the, the National Party government in South Africa thought that, I guess, black people were sort of getting inspired by what they were seeing on television. So I've had to kind of jettison Bill Cosby for my pantheon of heroes. Uh, I was wondering for you, um, is, that, is that something that you think about at all? The kind of, uh, have you, because in the essay, of course, you say that, uh, that the work is separate from the individual. Is that something that you still uh, believe or have you, over the course of the past year or two, sort of Thought about that. Well, yes, I was. I was defending um, uh, Saul Bellow uh, I, on the radio. I, so, I was suddenly confronted with this chapter and verse from the woman interviewer, and I was with the biographer of Saul Bellow, uh, who said, "You know, there's clear misogyny in in Herzog, for instance." Um, and after I thought, do I have to wait, raise my weary dukes to defend him from, from this? And actually, there is plenty of misogyny in Bella. Um, but I, I suddenly, I just said, and what follows from that? You know, so what? Now what? Um, and she did look as though she hadn't really thought of that. And I said, do we, what do we do about it? It's all better now. If, even if we establish beyond doubt that he has, he, he certainly writes about misogyny. And, you know, what about misogyny in Shakespeare? King Lear, but to the girdle do the gods inherit. And he's talking about a woman, see that simpering maid, but to the girdle do the gods inherit, beneath is all the fiend. Uh, there's stench, there's corruption. Five, five, give me an ounce of civet good apothecary to sweeten my imagination. I mean, do you, what do you, what do you do? It's, a, it's, it's not a literary consideration. Misogyny exists and it, it is actually a good subject for a novelist. Um, but it's, it's a social, cultural judgment, not a literary one. And if that, 
you know, this will be one of the things that undermines literature if, if these social cultural considerations really come to predominate and then you've lost something because the, the blamelessness of literature, a, a novel asserts nothing. Um, only when it is taken to assert something uh, do we know that something's really gone wrong in, in, in the reception of this novel. Like the satanic verses, Salman Rushdie, um, the Ayatollah Khomeini detected all, all kinds of blasphemy and, and hatred of Islam in that novel. Um, so, is that a literary judgment? No one thinks that. But um, a novel asserts nothing. Uh, and one great critic said that um, it was J.S. Mill who, who f first put this idea about the novelist isn't heard. Uh, novelist is overheard. It's not, it's as if he's talking in the dark and we're listening, but it's not as if he's addressing us. Um, and the idea that, that our minds are poisoned by these very regrettable things like misogyny, rather than dramatizing them and talking about them. If, if they're to be banished, then, then that's a huge wound for the novel and for literature. There are multiple uh, sort of pieces, reviews, essays in this book about Bello, Roth, Larkin, Abokov, um, Updike, among others. It's obvious that you've engaged with these writers for much of your literary life. Um, did you intend to do that, or is it just your love for them that brings you back to your work on a consistent basis? You follow your inclination. I mean, uh, the, the writers you like. Um, I have doubts about Uptake and, and Roth that I don't have about Nabokov or Beno. Um, but just as... I mean, I wonder if you feel this. I think all writers do to an extent. You write the sort of novels you want to read. And, um, and that, that's why you read the sort of novels you'd like to write, although you would never admit that. Um, that would be a disgrace. But, um, but it's really the case. I'm intrigued that uh, in much of your political analysis in this book, you will cite an artist, oftentimes a novelist, but sometimes a poet. And I couldn't help but wonder the extent to which um, your life as an artist influences or doesn't influence your political thinking. Um, no, they do feel very distinct. I mean, satire is, is the instrument for... for expressing hostile views about politic politicians and, and politics in general, perhaps. Um, and satire is, seems to me well past its, its uh, vigorous period. Um, another limitation of satire is you can't write it about an ongoing evil. Uh, it, there's, some, there's too much of a hostage to fortune. I mean, Satire is militant irony, and it wants to change the world, but it does so through, through caustic laughter. And how funny would Trump be if things got out of hand with North Korea and a, an American city disappeared, and, and Trump responded as he certainly would with a sort of arsenal clearing, obliteration of North Korea and with all the contamination that would um, it wouldn't be funny anymore. <clears throat> uh, you know, Swift wrote about famine in Ireland when that famine had, was over, or that particular famine was over. Dickens satirized imprisonment for debt in Little Dorrit decades after that practice was abolished. And that's the time for satire, yeah. when it's gone. Um, Otherwise, it it's makes you sort of very nervous to, to take liberties with a reality that is still unfolding. 
Um, humor comes up a lot in this collection, or the lack of it. One of your critiques of Donald Trump is that he seems to lack humor. Uh, in your piece about the porn industry, uh, for talk, one of your critiques of many of the characters you met was that they, were, they lacked humor as well. Uh, do you perceive humorlessness as a kind of character flaw? As a? As a character flaw? Um, well, it's, I, I regard it as a disability. Um, <laughs> I'm serious. I mean, um, it, said, it, said, it said quite fondly of Jeremy Corbyn by anyone who's interviewed him. You know, he's a bit short on the sense of humor. Um, as if this is just uh, the sort of thing that old lefties tend to be. But uh, I very much endorse the quotation from Clive James, who said so many great things, where he said that um, the sense of humor um, is, is the same thing as common sense. It's, it's, it's common sense working at a different speed. And that um, com uh, hu a sense of humor is just common sense dancing. And those who lack humor shouldn't be trusted with anything and because um, they've got no common sense either so never give a humorless person a letter to post and make sure you always help them across the road um, because they're they're completely helpless themselves i mean they don't know what's going on because they don't have this the, a common sense that has enough freedom to to laugh the humorless man is a joke and a joke he will never get. Um, is humor an essential component of a great piece of writing? Nabokov said that um, any writer is any good is, is more or less bound to be funny uh, or capable of being funny. Um, and I, I think that, that stares you in the face. Um, the, the gloomy, the tragic kind of novelist. And it used to be, when I was coming of age in the 70s, um, it used to be said admiringly of novelists. I really respect that writer's pain. Um, but actually it goes against the, the great majority of, of our writers who are, all tend to be, um, you, you know, capable of being wildly humorous. Um, the, the, the idea is still uh, present in, in some countries, like Germany, for instance, that, that either you're being serious or you're being comic, and, and never the two shall meet, um, is, I think, completely primitive, um, that actually it's when um, that, that humor is a great instrument for uh, emphasizing tragedy. Um, tragedy is not just po-faced, it's full of irony, tragic irony. Um, and it's always, there's always a sort of slight laughter going on in the wings, because tragic heroes famously always do have some some flaw that um, that that is seen from certain viewpoints is ridiculous. One of my favorite essays in the collection uh, was about John Travolta when you went up to, to go meet with him, and I hadn't spent a great deal of time thinking about this, but um, I guess the point one of the points you make in the essay is that, and I think this is a point that Quentin Tarantino also made is that he was actually uh, a great actor, that he had a lot of potential, that a number of people, fellow actors, critics alike, thought that he could have been one of the great actors of the generation, but he just made a series of bad choices. Yes, it's sort of too many bad choices yeah. for it to be an accident. Sure, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Obviously, you've had a successful and flourishing literary career, but are you, on the whole, happy with the choices you've made in terms of being a novelist and then going off and doing uh, sort of political journalism and, and the various choices you've made, are you happy with your, your trajectory? Um, yes, I'm <laughs> ag 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 agreeably impressed. Um, but it, it's, it's only, it's, you can't have a plan for your career. And 
just as you can't have a plan for a novel. Um, I mean, you better get a plan when you've started it, but you don't plan. Um, I've written two novels about the Holocaust, and both times I was asked many repetitively, um, what made you decide to write a novel about the Holocaust? Um, and two things are wrong with the phrasing of that. One is decide. That sounds to me like a description of writer's block, when you're sort of sitting there thinking, what should I write a novel about? The Holocaust. Um, <laughs> I mean, the novels don't come to you that way. They come, Nabokov called it a, a throb, Updike called it a shiver. It's a, it's a sort of sudden apprehension that here is a novel you can write. And as Joseph Heller said, um, nothing about it appeals to you except that you can write a novel about it. Uh, and the other thing that's wrong with well, why did you decide to write about this is about. Um, Julian Barnes has said around is a better, a better preposition. Write a novel around the Holocaust. Yeah. Um, you, you see, as Mill said, you, you, you're going to confront it, but only in a way that other people can overhear what you decide about it. Uh, it gets too much like um, lawmaking or prescription if you're trying to persuade the reader what to think about something or what view to take about it. All you're going to do is sort of throw up the sort of stimulating uh, situations and thoughts that, that you hope they'll respond to, but you don't take it head on. You know. I believe I'm running out of time, and um, I also want to hear your wonderful questions, so I'll just ask one more question. Can you talk about a piece of art that you've read or watched or engaged with that has moved you recently? Um, written art, because I'm... Um, I'm, it's the only art I really respond to, I've had to admit to myself. Um, well, I, I reread uh, King Lear the other day, and that seemed to do the trick. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you. Has, has your attitude changed about your father since you've become a parent yourself and a grandfather? And the second question is, do books still serve as a moral compass or center for an audience? You've talked about the multi-city book tour as being a reflection on the author, but notwithstanding your comments, is that why you do this? Um, so those two questions. First question is... Now, your attitude to your parents changes instantly within a couple of minutes of hearing your first child's first cry. Um, and then after a day, you know exactly what it is. You, you think, Jesus, you, you mean my parents did all this for me when I was tiny? And you instantly forgive them everything. In my case, there's very little... Um, all their supposed sins. I mean, it's a great vice to blame your parents, uh, certainly beyond the age of 16, or something, in my view. Um, but you, they get an absolute full pardon from you, almost at once. Um, and the other question was about the book tour. And more about you talked about well, um, I was looking again at um, something Hitchens wrote, and he, he, he said, I truly enjoy um, meeting this shadowy creature, the reader. And uh, um, it closes the circle in some way. And since 95% you know, of my time is spent alone, to feel a community out there is, um, is very heartening, particularly because I think I'm more and more convinced of this, that the, the, right, the novel is a social form. Uh, why is social realism easily the most dominant 
genre in 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 all literatures. Uh, it's because the novel is sociable. That your the the writer is a is a host and the reader is a guest. And I felt that relationship from both both ends. And I I want to be a good host and a thoughtful host. And that 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 that's quite a resonant decision when you consider that all the all the experimental quote unquote the all the the difficult novels that Lionel Trilling said we was the ones we really liked, they're all dead. All, the stream of consciousness is dead. The deductive novel where you have to sort of second guess the novelist, that's dead. Um, the baggy monster, which is very type of novel which is very discursive and digressive and won't stick to the point, that's dead. Um, and you know, what is emerging very strongly is that this this social relationship with the reader. Just to give a, a sort of imagined example, when you open a Nabokov novel, you feel that he's he's asked you into his house or into his private thoughts and he's given you the best chair in the room and a delicious drink and some snacks to keep you going till dinner and almost sort of caressingly uh, comfortable he makes you at once. Now if you go to look in on Joyce, you're given an address of a building that no longer exists. <laughs> then you find a sort of hut around the back and uh, knock on it and he's not there. <laughs> but eventually he does show up and addresses you cheerfully in a language you've never heard before <laughs> and serves you a, a lunch consisting of two slabs of peat around a conger eel. I mean, I mean, he makes no allowances for the reader. And when you look at uh, Nabokov's success rate as a novelist, it's, it's, I think, really almost uniquely high. So 15, 14 masterpieces out of 18. Uh, and you look at Joyce, and there's Dubliners, and there's about a quarter of Ulysses, and the rest is, is sort of brazenly unreadable. <laughs> what does Finnegan's weight welcome you to? As Nabokov said, it's a snore in the other room. Uh, to be obscure, to mystify, is a tremendous assertion of, of arrogance. And it's saying, you know, I'm, I don't really care about you, but I'm going to perform. And, um, you know, if you concentrate, uh, you will get the, the, the beauty of my genius. Um, I think that, that, that that's completely the wrong kind of, tone, it's the wrong subconscious attitude. You have to love the reader. And how do you do that? How do you make someone love you? By, by applying yourself at your very best, at your most uh, irresistible. Um, and certain writers, and I, I, I include Henry James in this, uh, might have quite liked the reader to begin with. Dubliners is very accessible and charming. Um, and early James, middle James, is, is him at his most capacious and welcoming. But um, by the end of, of James and Joyce, I think throughout, uh, it's like watching a, a, a marriage go bad in that they no longer share a, a bed, they it's separate beds, then separate rooms then separate apartments, and um, yeah, they get separate cities. And it, it, the, you can see the distance between them widening. And as Updike said, to, to describe something is an act of love. It's um, description is in itself praise in, in a weird way. And, it's those erotic, loving feelings that uh, I feel more and more at the basis of the reader-writer reader relationship. 
a question for you regarding um, the E equals MC squared of your works. Instead of identifying the one which is, you know, perhaps not foundational, the Hawking radiation. Yeah, I think you're holding the mic a bit. I, I can't hear it. Oh, you couldn't hear? Hold so, it a bit further. When you were identifying the difference between Einstein and Hawking, which is very interesting, suggesting that Einstein contributed E equals MC squared, something that's more foundational. Is there something of all of the works that you've written that you feel represents your foundation, your great contribution to literature? Of the books I've written? Yes. Well, I, I wouldn't like to single any of them out. They're, your books are like your children. Uh, you don't have favorites. Um, and Anthony Burgess, who wrote The Clockwork Orange and many other interesting things, said that when asked what his favorite book of his was, he would always say the next one. And uh, I, with novels, uh, I, I wouldn't point to any as, as being the end of the story, you know. Uh, you're, you're still, I mean, this is a, brings up a huge subject uh, and one unknown to literary history. It's a 20th century phenomenon, um, which is uh, medical science has given us uh, writers with longer lives than they used to have. I mean, Shakespeare died at 57, Dickens at 56 or 58. Jane Austen, you know, 41, uh, Anne Bronte, 29, Keats, 25. Um, the idea of the doddery novelist, which is what medical science has given us, is, 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 um, is, hasn't really been considered very deeply because it's so new. But most novelists tend to go off at around about my age. Um, <laughs> At the end of the biblical span, something happens. Seventies, uh, you can it either gets diluted and watery. Your talent, talent and originality are the same thing. It's been argued. Um, they're not elements in each other. They're the same thing, and it's very difficult to go on being original. Um, original to yourself, you know, where you think, ooh, that's original. Um, I've like said, sentences you write now bump into ones you wrote 20 years ago. You know, it's, um, and often with writers, you just feel they're fine, they're still good, but they're not moving forward in any way. They're doing the stuff we already know they can do. Uh, it's, it's hard to go on being exciting. To yourself, I mean, uh, so, and it, it's the, your technique gets better, by which I mean pacing and modulation and knowing what goes where and all that. But your the sort of wilder stuff that you used to enjoy as a writer can only retreat uh, until until there's a loss of faith within the right, and I certainly haven't come to that yet. Um, when, you know, do what Philip Roth did and just retire. It's, um, it's unthinkable to me, but I, I mean, when people start looking at me in a funny way and saying, I wouldn't bother with another novel, <laughs> um, I'll know it's happened. Someone said, I, I think it might have been Gore Vidal, that novels teach us how to live. Do you think there's any truth in that? Not novel. Novels teach us how to live. Um, and philosophy teaches us how to die, is, is, um, uh, as many philosophers have said. Uh, that's what it's for. I, I wouldn't say they teach you how to live. What they do is make living more enjoyable and more stimulating. You, I always used to say, I, when people ask me, you know, what, what's a novel for? I'd say, it's education, you know, we're in the education business. 
Um, and <coughs> that education is not giving you knowledge so much as giving you perceptions or stimulating your own perceptions so that when you go outside, the world looks has a, a more interesting color than it did before um, there's a layer of, of literary responsiveness is laid down in it. And I think that's, I still think there's a lot of truth in that. But when I read Stephen Pinker's book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, I suddenly upgraded myself, or upgraded the novel, in that he, he gives Why Violence Has Declined, is the subtitle. And he gives several examples, you know, most obviously the the, the establishment of the nation state with a police force. That makes a huge difference. But things like the invention of printing and the rise of women um, contribute to this uh, disdain for violence. Um, and then he said, and I really jolted when I read it, he said, the rise of the novel. If you spent, and we're talking about the middle of the 18th century, um, if you spent, and God knows how they ever did it, reading the five volumes of Samuel Richardson's Clarissa, a um, terrible book, uh, or Rousseau's, what, what is it, Justine, if you spend all that time inhabiting another sensibility and another mind, the, the old Christian principle, you know, do unto others as you would have them do to you, really does sink in because you, uh, it, he, uh, Pinker doesn't like the word empathy ever since he okay. heard a mother screaming at her two sons, I show some empathy. Um, <laughs> but, it, I mean, empathy really means the same thing as sympathy. And if you spend hours communing with and sympathizing with any other person, uh, then a, a, some sort of breakthrough is made. And he, he assigns the novel quite an important role in, in the de decrease in violence. And since violence is the thing of all human inventions, violence is the, is the most repulsive to me. I was very heartened. Um, so it teaches you how to live in a, in a sort of specialized way, of more responsive to the outside world, more in love with life than you were previously, and also l less inclined to beat up and kill your fellow human being. That's what it teaches. We're going to take these last two questions. Actually, uh, I teach my students. I, I use a, a small clip from Salman Rushdie. He says he speaks about the novel, and he says a novel is a way of going through uh, to get to human truth through non-truth. Going through fiction to get to things that you'll never, you perhaps you would experience on your own. And I, I just, you know, in, in relationship to the previous comment. I think that's a really beautiful, I wish I had said it. I always say that to my students, I wish I had come up with this. What, the, the aphorism was what exactly? Say again. He says, he's got this clip on, on the internet that says, you know, the, the, the brilliant thing about the novel is getting to human truth through untruth. So through fiction, which is not true, you don't have to know Anna Karenina to actually really begin to understand the feelings that go on. And so I think that's a really great way. That's the way, in any event, I pitch it to my students, and I think it's another way of taking a look at the novel and saying, you know, what do we get out of it? We get out of it, we, you know, it's a gateway to places and experiences we might not otherwise have. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> Yale Doctorow, a terrific writer, said um, the difference between history and fiction. He said, history tells us what happened Fiction tells us what it felt like. And, it, and it, it's the same thing as Salman was referring to, which is, is distilling the human truth from these events. 
as it was felt by individuals. Um, and, you know, if it can do that and lessen violence at the same time, then we can't do without this culture. Uh, so, like, given the uniqueness of a, no of a literary novel and how it stands apart from movies or TV and other ways of telling stories, and, like, how, well, how, why do you still think that the literary novel will, is on the decline and may go extinct? Sorry, I didn't, could you? despite the fact that it's so different from all these other kinds of media that people engage with as movies and TV. Um, well, I, yeah, I mean, I, I, I very much hope it's not on, in decline, but I read obituaries for literary fiction every week where they say that that's gone. And, and I think it's evident that the, the reach of poetry has much declined in the last two or three generations. Um, and I think I, I know why that, I partly understand why that happened, and I, and I can see a concealed threat to the novel. Um, you know, what a poem does, what a, a lyric poem does, uh, above all, is stop the clock. It says, right, we're going to take some minutes now to think about this epiphany in the poem is nearly always a sort of epiphany of some kind. And, <clears throat> and you have to bear with me while things go still and the clock stop, stops ticking and we examine this. Now, everyone is saying from all sorts of different angles that the, the world is speeding up. History is speeding up. Don't you feel it? It's sort of sort of agitation, acceleration. Um, now the novel already has adapted to that, not as a cynically, not in a sort of bandwagon sense, but just because novelists are modern beings too. So and they live in the present and, and feel certain things about it, and one of them being this sense of acceleration. Um, a poet Poets can't artificially introduce acceleration into a poem. It's just not the way the form works. But novels can and have and, and do. In that, um, I've talked about this with novelist friends, Ian McEwan and others. We have the feeling now that um, the, the, the arrow of development and moving towards something is much sharper than it used to be. That's why the baggy monster novel uh, from Tristram Shandy up through um, the present day uh, is, has fallen by the wayside because um, people don't have the, these, this endless fund of hours to commune with your novel at a stately pace. It has to speed up a bit, and there's a, there's a real pressure on the novelist to you know, get things moving towards something, uh, even if it's just a, a, a little climax that takes you on to something more. But there has to be a more immediate gratification, and uh, the, novelist, the novel can adapt to the, this up to a point, but it always does demand, you know, even a short novel demands four or five hours from, a, from the reader. And they're quiet hours uh, with you in communion with this voice. And uh, I, I do earnestly hope that, that you can continue to count on that. But if you look at a diagram of a an Ill illiterate brain, you compare it to a literate brain, all kinds of differences in, you know, bits dangling off and that bit smaller and that bit bigger. Um, but if you compare a literate brain with a, a technically digitally savvy brain, just as dramatic. And so that, what that means is that digitalized uh, media are changing 
the physiology of our brains. Um, so it's, it, we're speculating when we talk about the future, because we're speculating about the shape of our brains. Uh, and nothing can, nothing can be counted on, and certainly not indefinitely. As Saul Bellow wrote nicely in some way, he said, the fact that you're talking about climate change and the fact that um, the world is changing um, and, and in fact, under new pressures and stresses, uh, would no more have occurred to a 16th century uh, provincial resident, would no more have occurred to him than it would to the, to the dog at his feet. But there's not one of us in this room that isn't aware of these new, of a sort of sense of crisis with the environment and, and the idea that the world would sort of run out of its ability to sustain us is, is utterly new. All right, on that slightly sad note, thank you both so much.